As I said many times before, the mind is like a committee. It's got lots of different members. Each member lives in its own world, has its own ideas about what's going to lead to happiness. And sometimes they actually have meetings, and other times they just kind of move in and move out. But their worlds are pretty impervious to each other. Because each member of the committee has an idea of what's important in the world and what's not important in the world. And some members are pretty outrageous. Others are more reasonable. The outrageous ones tend to live in pretty distorted worlds. This is what the Buddha calls becoming. Each self or sense of self you have also has a sense of the world. And because the self is formed around a nucleus of desire, what's relevant in the world or that particular world is going to be what's relevant to the desire, either things that help it along or things that are going to get in the way. And so you find as you go through the course of the day, not only your sense of you, but also your sense of the world around you is going to change quite a lot. And you have to do what you can to make sure that your sense of the world actually is realistic. When you're in the world, it seems perfectly nor normal. But from the point of view of another, another self in another world, it may have been very distorted. Now, the fact that we have so many selves is one of the causes for a lot of confusion in the mind, but we can actually learn how to make use of it. This is what we're doing as we're meditating. We're developing a new self, the meditator, the one that's more firmly grounded in the present and one that has a better grasp of what's actually going on. Because the meditator can see the other selves as processes and see those other worlds as processes, too. And it does what it can to break the bubble of the really unskillful worlds. The unskillful worlds tend to be really resistant. They hold on, partly because deep down inside they know if they took a dose of reality, they would dissolve. But for some reason you either hold on to that particular view of the world or your particular view of yourself, for whatever reason. The self that feels wounded or wronged, that's one of the most difficult ones to get past. Because there's a certain satisfaction, so whatever anybody does to you has to be bad because you're wounded or you're wronged. And that way you can justify a lot of things to yourself. But whatever the sense of self, if it gets impervious, you've got to do your best to break into it. I was talking to someone a while back saying that you know, people don't really talk to each other. There's no way we can really communicate because each of us lives in our own world and we're very protective of what we'll take in and what we'll not take in. But as I pointed out to him, you know, the Buddha was very perceptive. He saw that. He, in each of those worlds, there's some suffering. There's always something wrong in that world. And if you could admit to yourself, okay, there's something wrong in the world that by inhabiting this particular world or taking on this particular identity, there's going to be suffering. Or there is suffering as I do this. And I can't blame it on other people. I've got to blame it on the fact that I've chosen this desire, and I've chosen this view of the world, and I've chosen this view of myself. Then there's a possibility of communication, of taking that world apart. And so this is what you've got to do as a meditator. You've got to look at the particular worlds you're inhabiting and see which ones are creating suffering. And apply that process that the Buddha recommends. One, see that the, this particular world will arise and it will pass away. 
That's two. Because you want to see when it's arising, what's arising with it. To see that the sense of self and the sense of that world, the self and habits, they tend to arise together. And they arise with a particular desire. And the desire comes because you're feeling lacking in something. You want to be able to identify that and to see how the desire is related to the suffering that's in the world. And when the desire goes, the, the world will dissolve. We don't see this process clearly because often we're just too busy moving on to the next desire and the next world and the next self that goes with that. So one of the purposes of grounding you in the breath right here is to have the breath as a different world. Your awareness with the breath as a different becoming. You in a different place. You're right here. And as you get more and more a sense that this is the normal place to be, and the mind when it's clearly aware of the present moment, just with the breath, that becomes default mode. Then you get a better perspective on the distortions in your other worlds and also the stress and suffering in those other worlds. This is one of the reasons why we emphasize that it's really important to have a sense of ease and well-being as your focus chair. Because we are, as we all know, when you're hungry, things don't really look the way they really are. Everything becomes a potential food. You start seeing things in a distorted way. So you try to feed the mind as well as you can with a sense of ease with the breath. And then when you find another world moving in, you can see it for what it is. Okay, This is based on this desire and it's based on creating this kind of stress and this kind of suffering. Do I want it? And this is where you get into the Buddha's next two steps in the analysis. Is you look for the allure and then you look for the drawbacks. What pulls you into that world? Sometimes it'll be the narrative that you build up around that particular desire. I was reading about a psychologist who was studying people's attitudes as to what makes them happy, and he began to realize that people had very unrealistic ideas about what was going to make them happy. They thought it was very peculiar, and then he reflected on himself. He liked to climb mountains. And he realized that while he was climbing mountains, he was miserable. You get to the top of the mountain, there wasn't that much of a sense of accomplishment. It was kind of, oh, that's all. And then you go back down again. And then as soon as he got back from the mountain trip, he couldn't wait for the next one. Even though he was miserable in the midst of it, his mind had created all sorts of a mystique around mountain climbing. And that's where a lot of us are. We have some very strange ideas of what's going to make us happy. So the Buddha wants you to actually look at, okay, what's the allure? What is your reason for wanting to like something? And then look at the drawbacks. When you actually have that experience, and what is it? Is it good? And what is, it? what is the cost? Yes. Our minds tend to be pretty bad at doing this kind of cost analysis, cost-benefit analysis. Those billboards they used to have on the road into Las Vegas, where they bragged that they have a 95% payback rate or a 96% payback rate. And people look at the bulletin boards and they still drive into Vegas. And the boards are basically saying, you give us a dollar, we'll give you 95 cents, we'll give you 96 cents back. And people still flocked to Vegas in droves. So again, one of the purposes of meditating is to put you in a place where you can look at things as they really are and do a genuine cost-benefit analysis of your different selves and the different worlds that you inhabit. Be particularly careful about the selves where you're 
getting into self-justification. Those have the toughest arguments. They have the hardest shell, but they also cause an awful lot of suffering. And so when you can see that, that the cost is not worth the effort that goes into it, that's when you want to look for the escape. And the Buddha says, basically, it's learning to see dispassion. Develop dispassion for those different worlds, for those different selves. And it's that realization, it's not worth it. That's when you really let go. You know, all too often we'll see the costs at one time and we'll see the benefits at another time, but we don't put them next to each other. We have some selves in our, in our stable here that we don't like, and yet they seem to have power. They keep coming back. That's because you haven't really seen their drawbacks, or you see their drawbacks, but you don't think about their allure at the same time. Or it's, you see the allure and it just blots out the drawbacks. You've got to learn how to put the two of them together at the same time. Say, so, oh, this is why I go for this, and it's dumb. There is a definite allure that if you don't see the allure, you're never going to be able to get past it. So we try to inhabit this space here with the breath as solidly as possible. So we can see those different selves as strangers. But this requires that you have a strong sense of yourself as a meditator. I was reading someone that talking about how when meditators are taught to meditate, saying that whatever comes up in the mind, you just look at it as neutral. Whether it's good or bad, you just be neutral about it. And they get a strong sense of depersonalization and alienation, because there's no place where the mind can land. What you want, as you get with the breath, is to have a very strong sense that this is where you really belong, and it's good to be here. And this is a more reliable self. So you do have a place where you can stand. And yes, you are passing judgment. Because what you're doing all the time, as soon as you jump into a new self, is you're saying yes unquestionably. And then you get up, it's something that's not good about, then you just drop it and go running for another one. And we all know it's like jumping from one relationship to another. When you're on a rebound from a bad relationship, you're just going to take anything which is no good. And it's the same way with the different selves in the mind. You find yourself in a bad self and you just drop it and run for whatever else comes up. You want to be more discerning. So having yourself as a meditator gives you a good safe haven to go. It gives you a safe space. And it's also your safe space as you're dealing with other people. Because remember, other people have lots of committees as well, and you never know which member you're going to, meeting, going to be meeting up with. And sometimes the bad members of that other person's committee will spark the bad members in your committee. So you can't re be responsible for the other person, but you can be responsible for yourself. Make sure that you stay with your healthy sense of self that you're trying to develop here as a meditator. At the very least, no matter how the relationship goes, at least you'll come out safe and you won't be doing anything to aggravate the other person more than you have to. And then you're just your mere presence might aggravate them, but then there's nothing you can do about that. What you can do is make sure that the self that you are inhabiting is on an even keel <coughs> and as close to reality as possible. So we're developing a good self here, one that we can rely on. It gives us a better position to look at the other selves that we've been taking on, all the different worlds we've been taking on, to get a better and better sense of what they are. 
for trying to get insight in the meditation is precisely here, seeing why you go for a particular sense of self or why you go for a particular world, what kind of desires behind it. And getting a better sense of which of the selves you want to keep in your stable and which ones you want to let out to pasture. So try to get firmly based here, right here at the breath. Just your awareness and the breath together, with a sense of ease, with a, with a sense of well-being. Because this is the self that's going to be able to sort everything else out. This is the world, the world of the present moment, that allows you to see those other worlds for what they are. 